tomorrow it's fight day. You bet. What are the thoughts going through your mind just a few hours before the event? You know, it's uh, in many ways we prepare just like the fighters. For me, I mean, fight day itself, I try to sleep in as much as possible. Just make sure you are, you know, totally rested. Uh, go over uh, any videos of the fighters last minute. Uh, make sure the notes are all in order. And, and really, to be honest with you, just, um, you know, visualize, just like fighters visualize, uh, hopefully a, a good broadcast and, and make sure that I'm as prepared as possible to to convey uh, the information necessary to the to the audience. For most of your career, you have been the lead play-by-play -play voice. Uh, lately, you've been doing the sort of third man role, mm -hmm. the Max Kellerman role, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, how is that for you? Is it an adjustment? Yeah. Do you like it? Is it a challenge? I'm a play-by-play -play announcer, first and foremost. That's the most experience I have. Uh, it is an opportunity for me to show my versatility and, and to, you know, take on something that isn't innate or something automatic. I mean, I've always wanted to challenge myself since I was young and and there, you know, people may not understand or, or even realize this, but I've done every sport imaginable, including curling, in really? which I was booed out of the building. I'd watched curling, you know, uh, very uh, as a cursory thing. And I did some research, made sure I knew what the hog line was and, and certain things, but I learned a valuable lesson that day. Don't try to pretend you know something if you don't. And and ever since then, and again, this is a very young age, preparation has been been my key. I mean, uh, people don't necessarily have to like my style or or whatnot, but they cannot question my preparation and, and you know, the knowledge that I bring. I'm, I eat, live, and breathe uh, my work, whether it is mixed martial arts, whether it's professional wrestling, whether it's boxing, whether it's pop culture. I'm an information junkie, and uh, and if I wasn't being paid for it, I'd still I'd still be doing it. So that's that's the the nature for me is the fact that it's it's a challenge, but one that I I, I seriously enjoy. Do I get excited? Do I get uh, crazy over dramatic? Sure, but that's me. You know that's me. I'm I'm the bipolar rock and roller. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a shoot. I'm not trying to, to, to add anything or take away from the fighters. The, the first thing for me is I am the soundtrack to the fight. I just want to make sure that that moment for that athlete, 10 years from now, five years from now, that when his grandchildren or kids are watching, ah, oh, dad, that's exciting. It gives me goosebumps. That's the biggest compliment I get is from fighters who say when they hear my calls, they get they get goosebumps, you know, because of the excitement. Okay, so you mentioned that um, you've always wanted to do this. Yes. Ever since you were a young kid, I, I've often heard you say that you've envisioned your life sort of playing out this way. When was the first time that you realized you wanted to be a broadcaster? You know what? I can go back to man i want to say five or six years old my parents are italian they came from uh, italy in the late 60s you know uh, uh, escaping a, a country that had been ravaged by war they, you know they were they were poor they were by no stretch of the imagination rich by my dad uh my mom settled in british columbia not knowing the language and having the three channel universe professional wrestling was a uh you know you you didn't need to understand you just knew that the black hat the white hat the good guy and the bad guy they got into pro wrestling had i'm the oldest of three kids born in 69 and uh, i remember from man four or five years old going to the matches with my family and just having that weird feeling in the stomach like wow this is cool like i want to be a part of this whether at the time i wanted to be a professional wrestler not physically blessed or or just even the announcing, just, just being a part of it. I can remember uh, always listening to radio, news, and and uh, and sports. Watching TV, I was always more interested in what the announcers were saying than even what the athletes, like hockey. And so I, I visualized, literally visualized, not knowing the term at the time, my, my future. And I'll kid you not, my friend, uh, it, it weirds me out, but everything I have wanted to do in my professional life, I've done and then exceeded. I saw it. I believed it and I achieved it. And it goes without a doubt for anything. I hear people all the time, oh, you're so lucky. Oh, you get to do what you do. Oh, you make so good money. Guys, I've worked my ass off to get to where I am. This is 24 years in the making. And and it's just, uh, you know, there have been many trials and tribulations. There have been times where, as, you know, seven years ago, I was rock bottom. I made $7,000 in 2003. Relationship ended, had health issues, uh, and, you know, so. Again, like me or hate me, but, uh, you know, I think people should appreciate that, you know, there are people like myself and many, many others that overcome situations and lead a, a positive, very active life. And I think uh, the one thing I, I want to continue to do and as I get bigger in my career is, you know, I believe in karma. I believe in giving back. Uh, and, and that's the one thing I always want to make sure that uh, I stay true to who I am. And, you know, and that's the other thing. I think too many people want to be rich and famous for the wrong reasons. 
for me, this is all I know. <laughs> this is all I know. Let's talk about when you hit rock bottom. Yeah. What exactly happened? Okay, well, I, um, I was diagnosed with, uh, at the time it was called uh, manic depression when I was uh, 19 years of age. My best friend at the time, who was as huge a pro wrestling fan as I was, uh, Michael Jansen, rest in peace, um, he was the first time that death hit me hard. Like, it was like my brother, you know, and he died of a heart attack at the age of 19, uh, very sudden. And that that gave me, uh, that, that sent me for a loop. And, and I noticed, and people started noticing uh, my behavior, my moods, like, things weren't right with me and uh very became obsessed with uh you know death and darkness and just really uh, not a good person to be around at the time and uh and uh, my girlfriend at the time became very concerned and she you know they they brought me to the hospital saying this this guy there's something not right with this guy and i had had success already with the wrestling all-star wrestling from 16 to 19. i think that also played a part in it while i didn't make a lot of money a lot of attention right away and and there is something to be said about uh too fast too much too soon especially when you there's no handbook there's no uh rinse so not to say i became like this huge megalomaniac but it was like wow you know this, this people know me now people this and then when that happened it's like that's not supposed to happen to someone like me my life's perfect I'm, I'm a i'm a child star so i uh it, i was diagnosed with having a chemical imbalance um and i fought it for for a long time i refused to believe that i, I was working in a nightclub as a dj doing uh local television i was on radio how the heck could i be sick i'm 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 not sleeping for days Oh really? <laughs> that's not that's not normal, is it, Morris? So um, it, it, I went on and off for a couple of years battling that, not taking any medication or anything for it, and then finally, years later in 2003, I'm living in a basement of my friend in Calgary doing a radio show in in Calgary morning show uh, as a sportscaster. I and and they were worried I was going to kill myself. Really? Honest to goodness, like they, I, I was all I would do was go to work come back down and just hang out in the basement. No more will come up for dinner, no. And I would just literally sit there. And even now, I, I, that person is so gone that it gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't even know who that person is anymore. But I, it was scary and, and rightfully so. So they put me on a plane back home to family because you know my parents being you know, Italians, of course, I, uh, I'm always gonna be uh, Mama Ranella's baby boy. I remember dry, uh, going onto the plane when we left off. When I saw my parents, I lost it. I was like, okay, I'm a, this is it. My life is over. Everything that I've dreamed of, everything that I've worked for, it's done, dude. You are, you're, you know, pardon the French. You're, 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 in, you're insane. Um, they put me in hospital. I was in a, a psychiatric ward. And it's almost, you know, God works in mysterious ways, whatever. But I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about uh, people. I learned a lot about uh, just the, the stigmas attached to, to mental illness and, and, and whatnot. And I then, right then and there, that time period. And here's the weirdest part. Uh, sorry, back up. The day I got back home, the day I arrived home from Calgary thinking my life was over, my career is over, my mom says to me, there's a guy with a weird accent on the phone talking about Los Angeles. You don't, I'm sure you don't even want to deal with this now. I pick up the phone and it's Boss Rutan's voice. And he's saying, Moro, you have to send a tape to Los Angeles. He's not knowing what's going on in my life or anything. We had met two years prior uh, on a bad movie in Vancouver, made connection. He was the first person that had ever said, you know, I'm definitely going to keep in touch with you and had done that and really wanted to work with me again. So two years later, he is giving me this opportunity, and it's the day I come back, so I'm not mentally well at all. I pick up the, and I, I collapse. I start crying, I'm done, because I cannot believe that on a day that I'm hitting rock bottom, this opportunity of a lifetime comes. And two weeks before my debut with Pride Fighting Championships, Bushido won in October of 2003, I was in the hospital. And um, I said, that this, this, is the, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And I'm saying, you know what, if I'm, if I'm gonna make it, this I have to be there for this. And I, they, they said, you know, you're fine. Just if you take your meds, do whatever. And and uh, so yeah, two weeks after, not anybody knowing, I get on a plane to to Japan to do Bushido One, uh, and it's like, wow, this is uh, this is the litmus test. And I'll never forget. Uh, first of all, just the opportunity that Boss and, and the, the people of Dream Stage Entertainment had afforded me. Dude, I didn't even get an interview. I sent a tape. I was doing Muay Thai for uh, TSN, which was a big deal for me too. You know, you're a TSN, Canada sports leader at the time and, and, and whatnot. And so I sent that as my, my demo tape. I get an email from them. I'm still in the hospital this time. I get an email saying, Are you, is your schedule free in October? And at the time, I'm like, well, Am I gonna be out of here? Is everything gonna be fine? So I said, of course, like, I, well, this is weird. So I thought, okay, you go to Japan, 
We do the first show, and at the time, Damon uh, Perry had replaced Stephen Quadros for the for the tournament, and I thought that was it. I thought maybe Boss, you know, being a good guy, is giving me a chance to do one show, put it on the resume, you know, add it to the building resume that I've got, and then maybe we'll see what happens. I'll see. We do the show. Yeah, I, looking back now, I'm I'm kind of embarrassed by some of the stuff. I remember the first slide when I saw my, they had the the parade of fighters and there's Mirko Krokom and I go, that's the most intense stare you'll ever see. Like really over dramatic. I was like, I gotta put all my eggs in this basket. I'm a pro wrestling guy. They like excitement. I'm gonna give them everything I've got for this show. And uh, and the funny thing is, after the show, I go back into the the hotel room. Boss comes back and he goes, Moro, and I'm like, oh, sh screwed up. Oh no, Moro, they. They, they're excited. They, they want to see you now. You go, you go in there. So I go meet the, uh, the you know, Saki Kabara-san and, and the rest of the Pride executives all in black suits. You know, it's kind of like a scene out of a movie. You sit there in the hotel. I don't speak Japanese, of course. They speak broken English. And I just sit there and they're like, uh, you know, Moro-san, very, uh, very happy with your work performance. I'm like, well, thank you. I appreciate it. It was a, it was a rush. Uh, the next thing I know, they're asking me, you know, be back New Year's Eve, and and then Boss went and talked to them, and he came running in more and more. You know, they wanna they wanna bring you on full time, dude. And I'm like, wow, well, that's amazing. So uh, without, uh, you know, before I know it, I have a two year contract with Pride. Ended up going to Japan 31 times in three years, and the funniest thing was that break that Boss Room gave me made me decide, you know, more. This is what you want to do. And I'm not ashamed to say whatever. Uh, since 2003, I've taken my one pill every day, and I've, I've, my life, I've never, I would not change my life with anyone. I would not trade my experiences. I, I just thank whoever is responsible. If there's a God, there's a God. Uh, thanks to Boss Rutan though, and and Pride, and then everyone else since. I mean, uh, wow, that's all I can say because it's it's been a snowball that's been out of control, and it's been amazing right since. Did Boss Rutan and that break save your life? Wow, good question, my friend. Eeks. You know what? I don't know if I was ever suicidal. Very depressed, and and um, oh man, there've been there've been times where. It's, I was a radio DJ, get this, I, I was a radio DJ from uh, 97 to 2003 at that time, like, uh, uh, no, sorry, I, I quit in 97, wow. I was a radio DJ from 91 to 97. And there were days where I was, you know, the afternoon guy, oh, well, you know me, always hyper, yo, 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 and away we go, CHWK 1270, yeah, beautiful sunshine, woo, 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 coming up, dead in a row. Mic off. Instantly tears, throwing things at the wall, like just knowing that I'm, this is all fake. This is not how I feel. This is not how. <laughs> Why were you so mad? I just, my mind, my mind wasn't where it was supposed to be. I know that the person that was happy and, and making other people happy or just pumping people up was not who I am at that time. And I felt like a fraud. I felt I'm going to be exposed as a fraud. That's why when people say, oh, you got a fake voice or you got this, <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is, I'm as, I think as real as anyone can get, I swear to God. I've got more foibles and faults and even, I mean, it's become, not a joke because I don't ever want to, um, uh, make light of my situation. The nickname, the bipolar rock and roller, if anything, I want to bring to light that, hey, I have a mental illness, I'm a very successful functional human being. And I want to say to everybody out there, and I know there are tons of people uh, who are, you know, going through depression, clinical depression, not those. And, and the worst thing people can do is, oh, get up out of bed or oh, what do you have to be worried about? Or look at you, you're, you're healthy, you're fine. Yeah, I don't have a, I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm not, I don't have bandages around my head, but at the same time, it's as debilitating as, as anything else. And yeah. so he definitely saved my, my, my life in terms of what I am doing. And I'll, oh, I mean, I take bullets for, for family. I will take a bullet for Boss Rudin. What happened when you arrived in Japan for the first time yeah. with your research? Yeah, I, I watched Pride, obviously, what, but being there for the first time and and knowing this is this is my dream. This is pro wrestling that's real. But there you go, uh, almost <laughs> almost sabotage from the very beginning. I get to Japan. I've got I've got copious notes on everybody on the promotion on everything, and this is this is my Bible. This is my security blanket, as Linus of the Peanuts uh, strip would say. And this is your big break. This is my everything big break. This is it. Up. Everything. This this is make or break for me for health wise. Nobody knows, but career wise, are you kidding me? The the biggest promotion at the time and my dream job. I get to Japan. And it's fine, it's kind of ironic, or I don't know if that's a proper usage of the word, but uh, Carlos Newton 
was on the same the first card with me. Canadian, fellow Canadian, mm-hmm. first UFC champion. I meet him in the airport. Hey, how's it going? We're talking. I get into a conversation with him. Leave my book there. End up on the bus. We all take a bus. It was about a two and a half hour bus ride from Narita to where we were staying in downtown Tokyo. Halfway through the ride, gotta start looking at my notes. There are no notes. And that's it. I'm almost, dude, verge of having another break. They're like, this is it. Someone is trying to tell me that this is not what I'm supposed to be doing, dudes. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm over. My life is done. I'm, where, where are my notes? The notes are gone. I'm, I'm screwed. Buddy, later that night, never, ever forget this. Knock on my door. And it's one of the, and I wish, I wish I'm an idiot. I usually remember everyone's names. And I don't remember this gentleman's name. And it's ridiculous because unbelievable. Dude, one of the pride people, PA, whatever, saw what was going on. Went back to the Narita airport, brought my notes back to me later that night, still get goosebumps. And I'm trying to give him money. I'm trying to give him any, like, you've saved my life. No, sir, thank you. Thank you, sir. It was just everything aligned perfectly. And then, even then, when I saw that, I go, wow, these people are amazing. And I fell in love with the Japanese culture. Uh, To this day, uh, the fact that I was able to uh, commentate some of the most memorable matches in MMA history and and just be a part of that experience of being in Japan. And I'm so sad that you know, Pride is no longer here because so many, I mean, even yourself. Yes, the Las Vegas shows they did, amazing, great. They tried. It's not the same as being in Japan. And I really wish every true diehard MMA fan would have experienced at least one Pride production at the Saitama Super Arena. Tremendous. Before we get to how it ended, what is the greatest call yeah. that you had while a member of the Pride broadcast team? The, the one that I think has been the most polarizing, and I think for those who truly understand me and know me and my style, the, the, the reality of it is obviously Randleman and Crow Cup. That call when, you know, they're, pulling, they're pushing the trinity of uh, MMA, Emilianenko, Noguera, and Crow Cup for this huge tournament. Kevin Randleman, you know, a guy who I still think, wow, the most potential of anyone I've ever seen, a former champion who unfortunately due to injury and, and other circumstances, I don't think has ever realized or probably will ever realize his full potential, but what a tremendous a personality, obviously a guy who got it, a guy who would have made millions in pro wrestling. But yeah, when he knocked out Crow Cop and my reaction at that moment, <laughs> I didn't even realize I was a commentator. I'm, I, and I've been told many, many, many times that was the reaction of people at home. That's what the f***, you know, ah! So that probably is my most, you know, my down goes Frazier moment, I guess, if you were. Your debut for Pride, very much a feel-good story. Sure. But uh, your departure yeah. was a bitter one. Yeah. What I, happened? I, well, I had uh, issues right away with the uh, the American executive producer. And, you know, it's even weird to, to bring up now because I've actually seen Jerry Mellon since. I will shake hands, whatever. He's not a fan of mine. I'm not a fan of his. I just... I did not like the way he did his job and and what he tried to do uh, to try to get rid of me, uh, you know, by accusing me of some very unbelievable things, Boss and I both. And when I, and it was funny because it was at a time where I thought things were almost becoming uh, better or at least workable with us. I was never going to be friends with him, never going to send him a Christmas card, but on a professional level, we could do this. And I remember talking to Boss on the phone and written like, wow, we all, that was a great show. Jerry, let us do everything. Well, wow, I think this can work. I think this can work. And Boss was very quiet. And he's like, oh, Maura, I can't believe I have to tell you this. I'm like, what? He's like, oh, you're in a good mood, everything. This is what he just did. Okay. I did. <laughs> uh, well, he told the, the people about whatever he thought we accused us of doing something illegal. So the next trip to Japan, I demanded a, a sit-down meeting with everybody. And the, my bosses in Japan the next morning came up when we were going to the boss. Moto-san, we never hear the F word so many times in half an hour in our lives. I'm like, yeah, sorry about that. No, no, very, very impressive. You stand up for yourself. So anyway, that was that. And, and to be honest, we heard the rumblings of, it was just 31 times. And again, having accomplished everything there, the writing was on the wall about pride with all the rumors about the whatever was going on with the yakuza scandal or or the fuji situation i said enough's enough at any point did you think maybe i made a mistake 
I no, I never looked back. Never looked. In fact, it was as I told Boss Rudin and now Stephen Quadros, who also went through his his issues with Pride, who I now work with. It was it was a breath. It was like a huge sigh of relief, and I feel to this day so bad for for the the organization and the fighters. Although, of course, obviously many of them went on to to great success, both in UFC and, and now Strikeforce. But wow, you know, nothing lasts forever. But man, oh man, Pride was something else. How'd you get the Elite XC job? That came through again. Showtime. Uh, I think what had happened, the, they were in the midst of putting together uh, their MMA package, and uh, I guess David David Dinkins, executive producer of Showtime Sports, and, and others had obviously heard my work in Pride and liked my style and whatnot. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm I think the teams in place right now, especially my challengers team, getting to work with Pat Militich, who is unbelievable. Like. Uh, talk about a natural and then the fight professor Stephen Quadros which I kind of get a kick out of because for a long time everyone said you know the two former pride announcers must hate each other uh, you know I replaced Stephen Quadros well actually no I replaced Damon Perry uh, but uh, so no I'm very very pleased with where everything is now and I just want I think even the UFC contrary to what maybe they say the competition and it's not even UFC is the the juggernaut strike force is trying to carve out its niche of the market give people athletes an opportunity to fight uh, be it on Showtime gives them original programming and obviously so far been so good I mean Ken Hirschman and, and like I say David Dinkins and everyone there and and really a guy that I want to single out here because I know the CBS shows maybe not have not gone the way we would have liked Kelly call the executive uh, uh, VP of uh, programming for CBS CBS, just an amazing individual, and I want to make sure I publicly say that. The guy has gone above and beyond uh, trying to help the sport of MMA reach the masses. And whether or not we return to CBS, Kelly Call is always going to be in my Hall of Fame. Gina Carano, uh, a yeah. bit of a negative yeah. situation for you sure. there. What did you mean to say that night, uh, it's, 25 centimeter pole, yeah, and, and what happened to you as a result? Well. There was this quote that came out of the press conference with Tanya Evinger and Gina Carano. Uh, G uh, Tanya says, I'd rather make out with Gina, but I'm here to knock her out instead. I thought, well, that's weird. <laughs> Interesting. So that's something I think would be lend some spice to the broadcast. So they're doing their, you know, they're, they're fighting. And I, I bring up, wow, an interesting uh, quote was said at the press conference. I say it. Bill Goldberg goes, I'm not going to touch that with a 25-foot pole. And me, in my mind, thinking, okay... Well, seeing the, it was an idiotic move, I guess, in hindsight, very much. But it wasn't what it would, came out to be. I said, I would like to see them kiss, maybe. So I would touch it with a 25 centimeter pole, meaning I'll be closer to seeing them kiss. Of course, I, no judge probably in any court is going to believe me. I understand that now. But man, yeah, I, I wish I'd never said what I said, obviously. And it did. It, it cost me, you know, I was. Did you I think was, for a second you might have blown it? Not at the time, because I just really didn't. In my mind, I just, my God, more. Yes, I understand what why people think what they think, but I'll be, you know me, I'll admit when I'm an idiot. And I've been an idiot many times. That wasn't what I intended. How surreal was October 4th, 2008? Yeah, how surreal was that? Um, see, not a, yeah, weird. That's all I can say about that was weird. What was going on backstage, what was happening in hindsight, though, maybe the best thing ever. I mean, Elite XC, I call them the Dolly Parton organization. Come on. Way too top heavy, my friend. And that's, and, and Kimbo Slice, bless him, all the money he made. Great guy. I've had a chance to talk to Kimbo. I know that Elite XC, just like Strike Force, has to have that niche. That's, I never begrudge anyone for having a gimmick to try to, to separate yourself from the juggernaut that is the UFC. In hindsight, um, yeah, wow, a surreal night, exactly. And, but not surprising at all. Petrozelli, I, I, I knew Petrozelli was going to beat him. Petrozelli's an MMA fighter. Kimball Slice was not an MMA fighter at the time. And, you know, he's, I hear he could be going to boxing now. I, I mean, the guy's a huge name. It's amazing at how much Kimball Slice has been branded. And, and, you know, I applaud him. He's doing it well. It's like anybody else. You know, Ryan Seacrest. A lot of people make fun of Ryan Seacrest. Guy makes, what, $50 million a year doing what he does? Bless him. You know, a lot of hate, a lot of envy, a lot of jealousy. I don't begrudge anyone making a living, but I, I wasn't a fan of the Elite XC era just because of what I saw. It wasn't it wasn't good for MMA. Who killed the Elite XC? Ah, uh, man. Variety of people. Uh, I don't want person to, in particular. I don't, I don't think there are any names, really. I think it was just, again, they, they were, they imploded. Like, they were, they were, they were a foundation built on, you know, chopsticks. It just collapsed. 
I see you have the suit on your bed. Yes. You're about to get ready. We're Show about us to get ready. What are we wearing tonight? Well, Before I'm, we as you know, a very uh, a fashion nice. a fashion statement. Gus Johnson says I'm one of the worst dressed people in the history of the world. Really? Yeah. But that's and he's right, by the way. But he's he helped me get a Hugo Boss shirt. But look at this monogrammed, M Ranallo. This was a a gift that was given me. This suit was given to me by. Uh, a very prominent person. I don't want to say where because then you'll see how old the suit is. Well, who's the prominent person? Well, I can't say because then you'll know how old the suit, the <laughs> okay. suit is. Uh, and then I got my Oscar de la Renta dress wow. shirt, even pressed, dry cleaned. Now, uh, Esther, uh, she's the only woman in the uh, room. Which uh, tie will go with this uh, ensemble, ma'am? Any of these jump out at you? Uh, let's see. Maybe? This one? I do like that one. Okay, good. That's the one. I'm not a fan of the one in the middle. Of the yeah, this one doesn't work with that. And this one I don't think fits either, so we'll go with that one. So yeah, I mean... Uh, Do you have a, styl a stylist? Unfortunately, I, I maybe should spend more time on, on the fashion stuff, but I got, I'm busy. I'm researching. I'm watching fights. You're but a fan. I'm a fan, man. At the end of the day, I'm a fan. Call fights. At the end of the day, buddy, I am just blessed that I get to sit in the best seat in the house and watch the greatest sport on earth. I've done hockey. I was uh, actually hired to do uh, Western Hockey League, uh, the first play-by-play uh, -play announcer for the Chilliwack Bruins. I, I did not accept the job because I went to Toronto. I've done all sports. I've uh, The two great loves of my life, MMA, professional wrestling, and I'm very fortunate to, to be able to do both in a, in a variety of ways. And, and like I say, when I get plaudits from guys like WWE Hall of Famer Jim Ross, uh, Al Bernstein, um, I mean, so many other great announcers, that's the best, best feedback I can get from my peers. And thankfully, and thanks to people like you and other, I, I, I hope that within even the MMA community, the online community, the, the journalists and whatnot, that I, I seem to have a pretty good relationship with them. And, and again, to those, uh, you know, the keyboard warriors as they're called, Thank God we live in a world or in a place, not a world, uh, a continent where you're allowed to, to say what you like and uh, we can choose to either, uh, you know, want to read it or listen to it or not. And uh, that's, that's the thing. I'm just very, very grateful that I've been able to, to do what I was put on earth to do. And I think the best is yet to come. Finally, you say you have accomplished everything you have uh, dreamt of in yes. your life. Anything else yes. out there? Is there Thank one you. thing? Yes. Any um, studios out there, my goal? I want to be a movie trailer guy. I want to be the guy when you go to the movies. Coming soon, Paramount Pictures presents a love story between Ariel Helwani <laughs> and his microphone. And even if that doesn't happen, sure. the kid who was uh, just a pro wrestling fan sure. in uh, British Columbia, wow. the guy who in 2003 only had $7,000, yeah, yeah. who was uh, depressed in the yeah. hospital. Oh, buddy, I've done not, a lot. You know, knock on, knock on the wood, I drop dead right this moment. Thank you, God, for the life you've given me. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob, buddy. A huge honor for awesome. me. Awesome. Very nice. One honor. of, if not oh, the best in the thanks. business right Thank here. Thank you. <laughs> shaking hands with Casey. Thank you so much. You're Mara. very welcome. I'm trying Thank to say you. goodbye to you. And you're, you're, you're rolling Let's all over the place. Say goodbye to everybody. This man, Mauro Ranallo, one of the best, a huge inspiration to me. Thank you so much for allowing us into your world and allowing us to go backstage with you. Best MMA reporter in the business. Mauro Ranallo. Good job, buddy. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, you guys.